We now are going to move into a uh, presentation on the clinical overview of lupus and available therapies, um, a presentation that will uh, hopefully bring all of us in the audience um, up to speed on the current thinking from a clinical perspective. So I'd like to invite up uh, Dr. Anka Askenaz, who is a Associate Professor of Medicine and Director of the Lupus Center at Columbia University Medical Center. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited and I'm honored to be here and um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to advance drug development for lupus, so thank you for inviting me. Now, my task is not gonna be easy because I have 15 minutes that I'm gonna try to condense all of what I've learned, so bear with me. Um, systemic lupus is a prototypical autoimmune disease with a wide range of manifestations, variable course, all of these making diagnosis, treatment, evaluation, and study of the disease a big challenge. Autoantibodies and immune complexes are the hallmark of the disease. The immune dysfunction leads to inflammation and tissue injury. Organ damage results from active disease and treatment side effects. Even with low disease activity, patients can still accrue damage. And because lupus is difficult, lupus patients are at risk of premature mortality. Um, now, in addition to the concept of systemic lupus that seems to be relatively well-defined, there's a whole bunch of lupus syndromes that include incomplete lupus, patients who have lupus but do not meet criteria for systemic lupus, and cutaneous lupus, which includes a couple of uh, um, several clinically heterogeneous subtypes. Some cause permanent damage, and they have significant severity despite at times only affecting small areas. So uh, it was already mentioned that the CDC um, put together a large effort trying to evaluate the incidence, the new cases of lupus, and the prevalence of lupus. Now, these data suggest that systemic lupus, with four out of 11 ACR criteria for diagnosis, has an incidence of 5.5 per 100,000 cases and a prevalence of about 75 cases in 100,000. So a little less than one in 1,000 people have systemic lupus. As expected, the female to male ratio is about nine to one. 90% of the people with lupus are women and the peak age is 15 to 44. Based on these numbers from the CDC project, Four academics, four centers in Atlanta, New York, Michigan, and UCLA suggested that the number of patients eligible for clinical trials with systemic lupus is slightly over 250,000. Now, the other thing that's been clearly pointed out by this effort is that the incidence and prevalence of lupus, systemic lupus, vary by race. Comparing black and Hispanics to whites, they have earlier age of diagnosis, about two-fold increase in the prevalence and incidence, and increased proportion of patients with severe disease and long-term complications. Now, beyond the incidence and prevalence, clinical manifestations vary by race. Um, it's a busy slide, but the bottom line is that African American and Hispanics, the orange and light blue bars, have more of the more serious manifestations, renal serositis cytopenias. And beyond that, the, the response to medications vary by race. But one thing is very clear, that lupus is a disease that can affect any part of the body. The manifestations are different in every person. The disease impacts people differently. But regardless of what part of the body Affect, is affected by lupus. Lupus is a disease of the whole body. The most common symptoms of lupus are joint pain, fatigue, and photosensitive rashes. Again and again, multiple surveys of patients bring up fatigue as one of the overwhelming and devastating manifestations of lupus. What is the goal of treatment in lupus? So we'd like to take active disease and make it inactive. 
and how we define inactive disease, I think there's still a lot of debate. And when we're making the treatment decision, we always bear in mind how sick is the patient. Is it mild disease, a little bit of rash, a little fatigue, joint pains? And I understand that a lot of people in the audience would like to debate what mild is, and a lot of people in the, drug, in, in, in the physician community would like to debate what moderate is. But all that being said, we still think of lupus as being mild, moderate, and severe. And severe, I think it's probably easier to, to figure out for most people. It is life or organ-threatening disease that affects the kidneys, the brain, the lung, or the heart. And when severe immune suppression with corticosteroids and immune suppressants is appropriate. Now, the consequence of disease activity and inflammation is organ damage. For kidney disease that affects about 60% of patients with lupus, at the end of the road of, of non-response to treatment, about 17% of patients with nephritis develop end-stage renal disease. How about the risk to the cardiovascular and cerebrovascular system? There is a very high mortality. There is a 17 times greater risk of death, death due to cardiovascular disease in people with lupus unacceptably high mortality. Now, recent data from the International um, Collaborating, uh, Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics put together this um, absolutely um, um, riveting study that says that despite the fact that disease activity goes down over time, you can see the mean sleet, a measure of disease activity going down on the, um, I guess, the, the right side of, of that slide, while damage continues to accrue. So despite the fact that we've improved disease activity, but not gotten rid of it, we have damage accrue. So the reality is that we're not doing well enough to treat the disease, to make it inactive, so that we can prevent damage. Now the other piece that happens is the impact on work, on, on the ability of people to be, uh, people with lupus to be active members in the society, to go to work, to take care of their families, to take care of their children. Um, so over time, and this is a study that had a four year follow-up period, a third of lupus patients stopped working. And, and of course, some of the more devastating manifestations like a stroke or neuropsychiatric lupus the numbers are a little higher. Unacceptably high work loss. Now, we have had major advances in lupus. And um, to just name a couple of the ones that have made a big impact, the discovery of corticosteroids that decrease mortality in lupus from 50% to somewhere around 10 to 20% at 10 years. Um, the discovery of the test for lupus, the ANA, the availability of anti-malarials, um, the, uh, the understanding of, uh, of an animal model for lupus, and then the big breakthrough of, of um, having diagnosis and classification criteria for lupus. All of these are major, advantage, uh, major advantage, advances in lupus that have created a much better outcome for lupus patients. In addition, the other big advantages are in the area of therapeutics. The, the discovery of cyclophosphamide as a treatment for lupus made a big impact. And then the discovery that mycophenolate mofetil is equally effective to cyclophosphamide has had a big impact on the lives of lupus patients. Further down the line, we have learned that rituximab, an and anti-B cell therapy, um, is capable of sometimes um, helping um, treat lupus patients. Uh, is another big advance. And finally, the, the much expected FDA approval of a drug designed for lupus, the, discover, the, um, the, the approval of bilimumab in 2011. So all those being said, um, and it's been already discussed here that there, is, there are only four FDA approved therapies for lupus. Uh, we're still in an area where much is needed to be able to provide 
better and, and more efficacious treatment for lupus patients. Of course, I need to say them because they're important. Aspirin, approved in 1948, corticosteroids in the 50s, hydroxychloroquine, and then belimumab in 2011. And over there, I put a list of, of, of some of the drugs that showed a lot of promise in phase two clinical trial, but phase three clinical trials failed. And, and the first on that list is mycophenolate mofetil that um, is so extensively used in the treatment of lupus. So mycophenolate mofetil and rituximab used a lot in the treatment of lupus and considered major advances in our, uh, in our therapeutic options are not FDA approved. So we've made a lot of improvements in diagnosis, in treatment. We, are, we have come a very long way. Um, mortality has decreased from about 50% at 10 years in a 1950s cohort to about 20% in a cohort that spans from 1980 to 1992. So a dramatic decrease in, in, uh, in, in mortality. However, mortality re remains um, higher than expected. And, and here, the slide shows that Compared to the general population, the risk of death in lupus patients is higher, with the highest, um, uh, with the highest rate being in the 16 to 24-year-olds. So it is obvious, I hope, that we need to do better. A patient in whom lupus is diagnosed at age 20 has a one in six chance of dying by 35 years of age, most commonly from infections or lupus. So, I hope I have made the point that we need to do better. How do we do better? We need more effective targeted therapies for patients with lupus. And what are our tools? Clinical trials and observational data. Now, a couple of thoughts about clinical trials and what, you know, what, what have been our challenges. Two major obstacles to drug development in lupus. One is the nature of lupus, and two is that there are not enough patients for all studies. What do I mean by the nature of lupus? Lupus is difficult to diagnose. It's difficult to evaluate. It's hard to tell sometimes that a person is sick. Lupus symptoms can come and go even when a person takes the medicine, making it hard to tell whether a new drug is effective and safe. And of course, lupus affects people and impacts people differently. Now, some other thoughts about the nature of lupus and why, clinic, why clinical trials are complicated. It's a complex disease, and because it is a complex disease, measuring disease activity has been complicated. The biomarkers are complex, and the clinical trials have been unsuccessful. We hope we have learned some lessons, and, and these are the lessons. We understood that we need well-trained lupus investigators, and several networks of investigators are being formed, so we're trying to do better there. We understand that the clinical trials, the way they have been traditionally designed, are not good enough, so we're trying to design shorter, smaller trials. And we understand very clearly that we need better outcomes, better biomarkers, we, we're considering organ-specific outcomes. And we're also, as we're doing this, we're very clearly aware that to better define uh, lupus outcomes, we need to pay attention to the voice of the patient. There are two sides to lupus evaluation, the side of the p physician and the side of the patient, and both of these have to come together. And of course, we probably need to design better drugs for lupus as well. Now, I had mentioned that we're concerned that there may not be enough patients for all the studies. Um, I think that we need to encourage participation in clinical trials. We need to create a culture of excitement and appreciation for the research and development in lupus, much like it is in cancer research. Um, and, and for the drugs in development, we need to make sure that patients of different race and ethnicities are present in the trials. And, and just because I have made the point that patients can respond differently to the same drug based on their race and ethnicity. Now, um, I searched theclinicaltrials.gov, 
and I found there that there are 531 systemic lupus studies. What a wonderful number. And there are 65 um, studies that are evaluating cutaneous lupus and 119 studies that evaluate lupus nephritis. There is hope for the future. One of these studies will provide better answers. So I hope I have made the point that lupus is underserved and there are only four drugs that have been approved by the FDA over the past half century to treat lupus. We need better, more effective drugs. And there's a great unmet need for more therapeutic options for this disease with very high mortality and morbidity. These are my disclosures. Thank you very much.